A group of, of legislators, rank and file legislators, came together uh, in late summer, really prompted as much as anything by the special session and the failure to move any agenda forward, not that anybody ever really anticipated we were going to move a pension bill in the one day that the governor called us in, but it was it was just a, a, um, a very stark statement as to the lack of progress that was being made and any and any and any, really any even any discussion about it. And we felt that the best way to move an agenda for a, some agenda forward would be to, to develop a bill that was sort of the history of this particular issue is that it, things really moved ahead when a bill was proposed. So um, we came together to, as members, and kind of a conscious decision to say we're going to just make this members, uh, members only. Uh, and so leadership was not involved. And this, the rest of the stakeholders, um, we felt that after sitting through many, many, many hours of meetings, uh, that we had a pretty good handle on where the pressure points were for each of the stakeholder groups involved, um, as well as the leadership, and what what would what were the component parts of a bill that would um, that would not only meet policy goals but also would could could fly politically. And so we came together, and and House Bill 6258 um, is the result of that. Um, <clears throat> We we um, we tried to let we tried to we let stakeholders the the the, the main stakeholders know right before we introduced the bill uh, we gave a proposal to the, the the same fact basically the same fact sheet you have before you uh, to Speaker Madigan about I don't know, ten days before the bill was introduced so you know this was not the kind of thing where we involved it's just again really involving but it was just this is about this is about members coming forth with their proposal and we felt in in the days leading up to the the introduction of the bill and talking to members that that was really appreciated that they felt that in many ways a lot of these big time proposals come down from on high and are imposed and said here it's 815 by 1015 you're going to be voting on a building committee and it's on the floor that afternoon um, and so the opportunity to to talk to a colleague about why we supported it um, and then to have an opportunity to go back and talk to the, the folks in their district and, and so forth was, was, was really a, a welcome change from the way things had been done in the past. So it created some momentum around, around the bill and, and uh, we think we, we, can, we can build on that momentum. With regard to the constitutionality, that was a threshold question that we had to ask ourselves, is what, what will meet constitutional muster in the state of Illinois? And frankly, the honest answer is none of us really know. And the, the justices you know, have really not given too much guidance on that in the past, because um, that threshold question has really never been asked of a bill of, of, of this type. The scholars that are out there run anywhere from, you can make no changes to any benefits, um, on one end to, on the other end, uh, the systems, all you have to do is fix the systems, make them viable, and that's sufficient, con that, that, that's sufficient constitutionality just by, by virtue of that. Um, we tried to pick something sort of in between. Uh, we do rely on the fact that we think that we are fixing the systems and making them financially sound so that members can be assured that they will have a benefit going forward rather than having no check in the, um, in some, at some point in the future. Uh, but we also uh, protect benefits earned to date, before as, as of the, the effective date of the bill, um, and make changes prospectively. And we think that the COLA is a prospective benefit. And there are certainly lawyers that think that the COLA is a prospective benefit, um, and, and things like that. Um, and then finally, and I think most significantly, uh, we provide a funding guarantee, which is something that the Supreme Court has said uh, um, pensioners in the state of Illinois don't currently enjoy is a, a guarantee that the state will have to put in its share in. And, and we do it a little differently than what's been done in the past in the 1995 law. You know, they can provide for a continuing appropriation, which everyone thought would be secure. Well, that went out the window. Um, and so we, um, we involve a third party in this process. We involve the pension systems who we give the right to uh, go to, to the court in Spring in Sangamon County and sue the state to enforce the payment. Um, the the amount of the payment is a little bit flexible. Um, it is uh, it's normal cost plus an actuarial amount to uh, to pay off the, the the backlog. But 
What I, one thing I've learned through this is actuarial science is, in fact, not actuarial science. It's actuarial art. And there's a lot of flexibility, I think, in that. And so that will be the nature of the court action. And I think that the state's ability to pay if we ran into another great recession, another great depression, would be part of that discussion as well. So um, we, we provide that flexibility. But nonetheless, there is a funding guarantee. There is a more enforceable funding guarantee in this than we think that anything that's been guaranteed in the past. That creates uh, a, right, a new right uh, that for the class of of um, employees and, and, and retired annuitants that, has, again, has not existed in the past. Um, <clears throat> this is not just Elaine Neckritz and Daniel Biss and a group of 19 other, or 18 <laughs> other um, legislators that think this. Um, we've had some discussions with uh, a um, professor at Kent, Kent School of Law who thinks that we are absolutely on the right ta track of how the justices would think about this, um, both in turn, well, in primarily in terms of the fact that even when you have very clearly delineated constitutional rights, that the justices do look in the, uh, at the, at the can, and, 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 and there's been case law to say, we do look at the surrounding circumstances, and in the event of a crisis, which I don't think anyone would acknowledge we're in right now, that there are, they can take other factors into consideration other than the strict four corners of the, of the Constitution. So so, um, you know, we feel um, good about having that affirmed for us by at least one scholar in the state of Illinois who's taken a look at this. Great. So what I thought I would do uh, is say a bit at kind of a 30,000 foot level about the framework of the bill uh, and then just let you guys guide the whatever detailed questions you might have. But about the framework, I would say that um, we're fairly constrained if you look at the depth of the problem and look at other jurisdictions like Rhode Island, for example, that have uh, taken on problems of this depth, um, there's only so much you can do. And what they tend to find themselves doing is a three-pronged approach. They deal with benefit reforms for current participants, they deal with risk sharing going forward, and they deal with funding mechanisms. So what does that mean? So for benefit reforms for current participants, that means you know, in fiscal year 2012, we put 4.8 billion in the pension system. Fiscal year 2013, 5.7. It's going to be another billion more than that next year if we don't do anything, and so on and so on. We attempt to put in place reforms that will substantially reduce both normal cost and the unfunded liability so as to start to control that cost growth. What we think is somewhat novel and what we personally believe is an improvement in this current plan is we do that in a way that achieves two policy goals. First of all, it protects those with the least, so people with smaller pensions are shielded from the worst of the cuts. And second of all, it protects those who are furthest along in their career, particularly those in retirement and close to it, so that those with less time to plan have less change to plan for. But we still believe, and we will talk soon with the systems um, who are nearing the conclusion of their actuarial analysis, that will do this in a way that will achieve very, very significant savings, enough to put the state on a path to sustainability. Second, on uh, risk sharing, we put in place for new employees in TRS and SURS a cash balance plan, which preserves the minimum benefit features of the defined benefit systems we currently have. We think that's very important for non-Social Security participants. But beyond the minimum benefit, the level of the benefit turns out to be a, a function in large part of investment returns so that if we have another financial markets event like 2008, we won't see that the entire brunt of that is borne by the state and the employers. Instead, it'll be shared between the employer and the employee. And finally, on funding, we have a grab bag of a number of different approaches. Um, I think the two that deserve highlighting are, first of all, as Elaine mentioned, the funding guarantee, which we think is significant. We, my belief is that if we had that in place 60 years ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Uh, Elaine made the critical point of what that means for as a give to the participants in the systems and therefore uh, uh, an argument in favor of constitutionality, since that gives something in exchange for which something else may be taken. Additionally important is simply that it's sound fiscal policy. You don't, we don't want to be shorting the systems. We don't want to be promising the benefits and not paying for them. That's, that's bad for everybody. So we think this is a, a, a very meaningful and win-win provision. And the other provision that I think will likely be the topic of some discussion this afternoon is the cost shift. So we keep the cost shift in this bill, um, though I would argue that we 
mitigate it substantially from previous proposals, and I think one piece of circumstantial evidence for that is this is the first bill that contains a cost shift, or even the first bill that weighs in on the cost shift question. Either way, to have Republican and Democratic sponsorship, we have, in addition to us, who represent affluent suburban districts for whom the cost shift is probably harder than anybody else. We also have two Republican co-sponsors who also represent affluent suburban districts. And, and we think that that's because of the steps we've taken. Uh, first of all, the cost shift has slowed down. It's now a half a percent of payroll per year, which we think is much more manageable to build into contracts going forward. Um, the savings are more certain because there's no complicated set of choices. So once the actuaries come back and tell us what normal cost is, and we think they're going to tell us a low number, that's normal cost. And the, the entities to whom cost is being shifted don't have to wonder, wait, will people really pick the right option for which that prediction is, will come true? Or might they pick something else and balloon up normal cost? So we think that's important both for certainty and for what we expect to be a low ticket at the end of the day. We put in place the strongest language that's been seen so far to segregate accrued unfunded liability from normal cost going forward and keep the former on the state's books. So regardless of how long it takes to pay it down, the un unfunded liability is not going to slip through that firewall and go onto the, onto the district's uh, responsibility. And last of all, the cash balance plan for new employees, it sets a minimum benefit level, and a minimum employee contribution of 6.2%, which we get from Social Security. But above that, whatever the employer wants to contribute uh, toward the benefit, is negotiated with the employee locally. And so we give them a, a pretty substantial amount of control, which I think is a much more logical thing to do than dumping the cost on them. Here we say, sure, the initial argument is let them pay for it since they're setting the salary that determines the benefit. That's all good and well, but now they also have substantial jurisdiction over the actual generosity of the benefit itself relative to the salary. Putting all those three things in the same hand is uh, it's good economics, and it's a much more reasonable thing to ask of them, we think. So for all those reasons, we think this is a, a more palatable cost shift. We're still very happy to negotiate further. Um, parochially, we're thrilled to negotiate further because it helps our districts the, the more we ameliorate this. But we, but we do think it's good fiscal policy and good economic policy to get it done in one way or another. We think that, that alignment is critical uh, to keep cost controlled going forward. So here we are in the middle of December. We really, we filed the bill almost two weeks ago. We had that large group of co-sponsors that we're thrilled about. We're reaching out to our colleagues, uh, having a lot of good discussions. There's a lot of interest in what numbers come back from the actuaries, and we expect to have answers to that extremely soon. Um, and we're listening to all the stakeholders. We are hearing from labor and having conversations with them, from business, from employers at both the um, TRS and SURS level. And we feel like we have a short timeline until January 9th, but not an impossible timeline. And we all know that now the state's been downgraded again. We think the fiscal pressure is continuing to mount. We think that this is a, a good framework to get something done. We think we have more momentum for this than any pension reform plan has seen so far. Um, so we're just going to keep pushing and see what we can achieve. And, and I would just end on this point of pressure and the ratings agencies and the urgency, understand that no is an option, that doing nothing is an option. The problem is so big that it feels like we have to do something, if not this year, then next year. And so why worry so much about when it happens? But the truth is that we could not do anything for 10 years. It would be catastrophic for the state, but it's possible. And so we, we feel like circumstance is never going to put a gun to our heads. Circumstance is just going to put a heavier and heavier weight on our chest as we lie in bed at night. And it's our job to make that more immediate uh, set of urgency so that we can really get this thing across the, across the finish line and convince 90 people, none of whom want to take this vote, that now is the moment to really solve this problem and get the state moving forward. I'm going to ask a couple of questions the readers put out. and. I've been so bogged down in this for a long time, it feels like, from a reporting standpoint. But they ask some questions that I think are reasonable, and, and a lot of people, and I think those of us who work at the Dome don't really consider too carefully. But, you know, the judges are left out. There's a sense that that is extremely unfair, and people kind of want to know why, why are they left out of this plan and every other plan that we've seen. Can you explain that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> it, it, 
every other state that's gone through this process has it's they've had a lawsuit um, and there have been uh, results where the judges have um, ruled themselves uh, exempt from these from these kinds of change or, or ruled the bill unconstitutional because of the changes to the judges um, I need to double check, Chris, but I'm pretty darn sure that our Constitution not only protects the pensions, but also protects the salaries of judges, because you can't, you don't want salaries of judges being impacted by the decisions they're making. And right. uh, and so the, the... In fact, they ruled several years ago that they right. had to have their raise. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so what, what, what my fear would be is that they'll use that particular portion of the Constitution to undo the whole thing. And 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 never even get to the the other the other question. So there's some. There, it was a, it's a strategic decision um, to to say we want to give this the best shot we can to figure out what is going what what is going on constitutionally, and I think that the best shot we have to do that is um, is is to leave the judges out of it right now. So do you go back and, and do them later after the, the this has been I, I think, hashed I think, out in court? I think we'll 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 see what they say. Yeah, you know, and then and then make that decision. Okay, and then of course the other hot button topic, especially around here, is why don't you you know why don't you reduce your own pensions? Are you guys in on this? There's always a question about that. I think we've reported that you the legislators are, but if you could explain to the extent that you are and how that how that so works. We are in on it in the exact same way that SCRS is. So. TRS and SURS are slightly different because there's the cost shift in there, and therefore those employees get a better deal with the cash balance plan for Tier 2. So SCRS and GRS and, and the legislators have a slightly worse deal because we don't have that cash balance fixed for Tier 2. The only other difference is that we then hit ourselves harder um, because when Tier 2 was created, the legislators got a better deal on the COLA, and we do away with that. Uh, so I'm, I'm personally, for example, going to be hit in a way that my a tier two colleague of mine at SCRS would be untouched. Well, you, you'd, be, you'd become comparable to that SCRS. Right. right. Yeah. And you're, you're a tier two right now, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I intend to stay there. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the other thing I would, I would add to that is that um, GARS is currently 19% funded. I think it's actually just over 18%. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> GARS being the general assembly. The general, 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 general assembly retirement system. Retirement system. Yeah. Um, I think that even if we undertake the dramatic reforms that we've got in this bill, it's unlikely to solve to address the underfunding problem in GARS. Um, and I think we need, you know, and and to to think that in the future, if GARS does go, uh, it does become insolvent, that a future general assembly is going to come running in and bail it out. I think is pretty unlikely. So, um, so GARS faces challenges just financially that the other systems do not. And I think that you know that that GARS is. I, I, I would. I've never asked the question of GARS as to what its its longevity is, but uh, um, I'm I'm guessing it's way less than than the other systems. Okay. Were the unions, and please someone else jump in if I, I have a ton of questions. But if you have questions, jump ahead of me, please. Uh, <laughs> is, are the unions are they satisfied with the guarantee language that's in there? Have they expressed support or they wrote opposition? It. Oh, they wrote it. Okay. And can you explain? Go ahead. Where are you getting the most difficult objection from, and how, you, how, how do you overcome that? Whatever it is, I mean, the, somebody's got to be throwing something at you. <laughs> I mean, it's not a it's not a big love fest out there on the on the bill. No, I don't think it is. So we're we're pleased that uh, we're getting in trouble from all sides. So yeah, that, um, <laughs> it is I, actually a good sign. And I'm I'm tongue in cheek, but also half serious. That yeah. you know, no, nope, it's not. And and I and I'm but the the problem is really awful, right? I mean, that here we are, and the the. The amount of pain to be distributed across participants in state government, whether they're taxpayers or service recipients or employees, is, is tremendous. And, and so here we are. What I will say, though, is this. Um, the tone of the opposition has been different. And I think that's, I mean, I would love to think that's because we wrote a phenomenal bill. And, and I do think that there are critical improvements in this bill over the, the previous attempts, because we learn. 
we, we watched this movie at least twice, and Elaine's seen it a couple more times than that, and we, I think we learned really important policy lessons from, from that. But I think the biggest change is the process change. We're not kidding around. We really are listening. We really did file this bill the last day of session with a month of time at home to talk with stakeholders. And I, I think they understand that that's, that's a statement that's born of sincerity, not of political posturing. And um, the opportunity to weigh in on something as emotional as your own dignity in your last year is, is, is valuable to people, even if the outcome is not so attractive. And I I think the two biggest areas, frankly, are the, the benefit impacts. And, and what benefit impact uh, it, it, we hear about depends on who you're talking to. Yeah. You know, and so it's, you know, it's all, it's, it, 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 this impacts each individually, each individual in a very unique way. And so we hear from them on, about that uniqueness. Um, the other would be the cost shift. I think those are the two, um, the two most difficult areas. Can also. You can you talk a little bit about the cash balance plan um, and what the merits? I give him 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and what the merits of that are versus the, the folks on the right, the Illinois Policy Institutes of the world, would say, this is not good enough. We need to go to 401ks for every employee. Can you talk about that for a second? Yeah. For so a few minutes. I will be very quick in saying what the cash balance plan is, and you can instruct me to say more, but I'm not sure. going to subject you to more unless you, <laughs> unless you really ask for it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it looks like a 401k and that the employer and the employee make contributions of a fixed amount. Um, but then instead of the employee directing their own investments, it just stays in the fund. TRS will stay open for business and the money still goes in and then Dick Ingram and his people are still going to invest it. Dick's the one who invests it, yeah. not the individual. Not right. the individual, Retired. exactly. Okay. And then you've got an interest credit. If, you know, depending on how well Dick's guy is to it, investing the money. But that interest credit isn't exactly what they get. There's a minimum floor, so that if their investments tank, you still get a certain credit. And then if it goes above that floor, uh, there, some of that excess goes back to the system to ensure against the times that it goes under. And the idea is that you're not completely at the mercy of the market. You still have a guaranteed minimum benefit that goes up every year regardless, but how much it goes up does depend on investments, so the state has much less risk than under the current system where we're essentially guaranteeing an 8% return per year, every year, and from the minute the person walks in until they die. <clears throat> so that's that's the, the model, and I could go on forever talking minimum, about why I like it. Is Sorry. the minimum basically Social Security, what these folks would get if they were in Social Security, it depends, or is it even more? It depends upon the the details of the person, but yes, it's more. Okay. You, you should think of it as, as, as in the, under the worst case scenario, it's still going to be more than Social Security. Social Security plus. Oh yeah, talking, absolutely. At least. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so why not but, just move to Social Security? So, so that's exactly the question then. What, what about the Illinois Policy Institute? What about going to 401k? A few things. I, I think it's not acceptable to go to just a 401k without Social Security. I think that's bad public policy, and I think the notion that the only worker in America who doesn't have some guaranteed benefit is the Illinois teacher is not where we want to go. Is that even legal? Can yep. You, oh, it's it actually, is. as an aside, what the IRS says you have to do to instead of Social Security is a 401k where the total employee plus employer contribution is 7.5%. Right. So what, what we could do if we wanted to really stick it to them is say, you're just going to get a 401k, we don't put in anything. And you put in seven and a half percent of salary, we're done. To me, that's unconscionable, but it's legal. Um, so maybe the Illinois Policy Institute wants us to do that. I don't know. It's hard to tell with them sometimes. I was going to speak to that, so go ahead. <laughs> but if you do go into Social Security, then then you're talking about a serious expense. That's six point two percent of payroll on the employee side, 6.2% of payroll on the employer side. That's 12.4% diverted away from solving the problem here and, and to Washington. I, I, that's, that's in a time of such scarce resources, that seems like not the best use of 12.4% of payroll. And then the other point to that point is if you shut down the pension systems and put everyone in Social Security, you're diverting all the money away from the systems. And I'm not a big believer in calling, calling these things Ponzi schemes if they're well run. When, we, when this bill goes into effect and 30 years later we're fully funded, it won't be a Ponzi scheme, but today it kind of is. 
And if you shut down the Ponzi scheme, the person who's currently retired is the one who winds up mm. at risk. So the, the thing about the cash balance plan is it shelters the, the state from a lot of the risk, accomplishing most of what the 401k accomplishes, but it keeps steering the money into the system so we can gradually climb back to a level of high funding and then make whatever long-term transition that we, we want to make as a matter of policy. If I were John Tillman here, I would say, well, your, your, the rhetoric is you're directing it into a broken system. Why are you doing that? What's, what's the response to that kind of rhetoric? I mean, you're saying that we will fix it if we do it that way. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we've got a bill here to fix the system. Mm -hmm. he's, he's making, I believe, a philosophical point about defined benefit pensions. And I disagree with him. If you have a system that, where the cost is reasonably predictable and you have a way to pay for it, and you make the payments. And I, I would agree with, with Daniel. I, I struggle with what they're actually saying because I've appeared with Ted Dabrowski on this, right. and he talked about Rhode Island. And why don't we go to the Rhode Island model? Well, the Rhode Island model has a minimum defined benefit, you know, minimum defined benefit with a, with a true defined contribution plan on top of it. Well, the cash balance plan is really a sort of a minimum defined benefit with a, with a, you know, with, with growth on top of it. It's, I, I can't figure out why, why what we're proposing is an anathema mm -hmm. when they're talking about Rhode Island and Rhode Island still has a defined benefit portion to it. So. Right. Okay. So you said, a slow on the uptake, you said that unions wrote this? No, no, no. no. Not the bill. Guarantee. They wrote the funding guarantee. Oh, okay. One thing they've insisted on, John, is that, you know, right now we don't have a very good, we just don't have a very good way to make the legislature put the money into the right. systems. We just don't have a very good way to do it. Yeah. And so they wrote the portion that would um, make the legislature do that, or a, a, a it, mechanism. come as close as you can. A to mechanism the to go to court it. to get them to do it. Right. Okay. Right. Well, let's actually let's go to that. Um, can you explain? Okay. If I'm a state worker and the state skips a payment or owner funds, how does that, what's the mechanics of that? How, how do I go to court to enforce my, my rights under this bill? This, the, the, the individual worker does not have that right. Okay. The system has that, has that ability. And so the, TRS, so TRS. TRS of the, all, and any one of the pension systems, correct. Um, and they file a mandamus action in Sangamon County um, to enforce that payment. And the payment that they're enforcing is, as I think maybe we mentioned earlier, normal cost. Um, plus an actual an actuarially determined amount that will um, pay down go toward pay down paying down the unfunded liability and that will be the argument in court as to what that amount is for that particular year but the legislature like they did under Blagojevich, they can't it, it can't say we're taking a two-year pension holiday this year that would not fly under this bill we well the, the thing I the thing I what we did there was we changed the language on the continuing appropriation right. in a bill. We would have to, in this, because this would not be, um, I mean, you could probably still call it part of a, a BIMP, mm -hmm. um, but I think it would be harder to do. Yeah. And to, to just eliminate that, that right. Um, but I think it's harder once you've granted a right to sue to just say, I'm going to take that away rather than changing the continuing appropriation. and. Because I think the courts would look askance at giving them say in something where you know we've now sort of uh, muddied the the separation of powers and said yes you can force the legislature to do something and then oh by the way no I changed my mind on that I'm like the, I'm not sure the courts would look very favorably on that so I think if the systems went ahead and went to court and said they gave me this right but then they took it away for two years with this but, exactly special legislation. I, I, I think the courts would would really struggle with that. I, Mm -hmm. You know, it's just my my stupid real estate lawyer's opinion. But sure. Yeah. <laughs> and as a stupid guy who never set foot in law school, one thing that the unions put in the paragraph to try to strengthen that is it explicitly describes this right as coming under the contractual yeah, relationship right. protected by the pension clause. Yeah. And so what they're trying to do is essentially implicitly write it into the Constitution, into the Constitution. Right. so that it's then now a constitutional right we would be trying to legislate away. Okay. I'm a mathematician, but it's an interesting idea, certainly. It is interesting. Uh, one, yeah. one more point on this, um, about the difference between the individual suing and the system suing. The idea here is it just would be a little bit um, unwieldy to have, you know, hundreds, of, hundreds thousands. of thousands of different people bringing suit, but know that the systems will have a fiduciary responsibility to their members to bring that suit. So it's, this is not supposed to be a way out. Right. 
So does the continuing appropriation then go away as a piece, as a piece of law? There's a, there's a different continuing appropriation now. Now it's we, we go from a continuing appropriate to get to 90% funding by 2045 to a continuing appropriate to get to 100% funding in 30 years. But there still is a continuing appropriate oh, in there. Good. It's just that that's not what's constitutionally, what's, what's legally protected. It's the actuarial number that's protected. Thank you. <laughs> and, and here's why. The appropriate says you're going to get to... 90% funding in 2045 or 100% in 30 years, depending on if we pass this bill or not. And thereafter, you'll stay at that amount forever. So let's suppose we get there, and then 2048 happens, and there's the next great recession, and the, asset values lose, the assets lose 25% of their value again. Under the continuing approach, we'd have to repay that all back into the systems in one year. That's literally impossible. It would shut down state government. So you don't want that number to be put in, stash, in, in in that protected, enforceable way. What you want to be enforceable is do what the actuaries say. say. And that's what is protected. So the actuaries will say, okay, gosh, we lost 25% of the value. Here's the appropriate way to amortize the debt. And that's what's then protected. I asked a couple of questions from the conservative side. I want to ask a couple from the, the left or liberal side, I suppose. Ooh, I'm a lot more comfortable there. <laughs> so. Why not just, uh, instead of making the employees uh, pay more, have a lesser COLA, et cetera. Why not, A, either raise more revenue in some way, or B, recalculate or re-amortize the current, uh, the, the plan from 1990, was it? Joan, 95. You were 95. 95. Yeah. Why, not, why not redo that completely so we have, say, kind of a 30-year mortgage type of situation, although it wouldn't be 30, it would probably be 40 or 50. And, and relieve the state's financial pressure that way. Um, with regard to the revenue question, I, I think that we, um, we, we have, we had, to me, when, when this whole, when we really got into this fiscal mess, we had three, three, three things that we had to do to get out of it. We needed revenue, um, we needed spending cuts, and we needed reforms. Um, we've we've dipped into the revenue well. Mm -hmm. um, we're continuing to make some very significant cuts, um, and both of those have impacted constituencies in the state of Illinois in in a very significant way. Right. Um, and the 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 third the reforms, um, you know, in order if if we are to share the burden as broadly as possible in the state of Illinois. This is what this is the direction I think that we have to go. Um, I do, and and I also believe that the next time politically that we will have the opportunity, and I and I want to try to be as realistic about the politics of this as I possibly can be, um, and deliver that message to the to the citizenry, is we're not likely to have that discussion for, before January one of twenty fifteen when the when the and and when the tax when the tax rolls increased. when the income tax increase in the income tax for the most part rolls back, I think that's a time when we can have a discussion about um, about a revenue structure for the state that grows with the economy, um, that makes sense for paying for the services that, that we want in the state of Illinois. But I don't think we've quite demonstrated yet to them that to the to the vast majority of citizens that we're responsible um, and and have taken the steps that we need to take in order to be able to um, go back and have a discussion about about revenue and I just think think that's the political reality of, of, of where we are right now so I'm just I'm not I you know if someone wants to try to pursue a constitutional amendment and get 71 votes in the house and six you know 36 in the Senate and get 60 percent of the con of the residents of the state of Illinois to send spring sense gen the General Assembly more money I'm, I'm not optimistic about, about their chances. You're talking about a graduate or progressive yes, tax. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. the unions were supposed to have a thing today. They canceled it they canceled because of it, the right. shooting and everything. Yeah. Um, but I suspect that was on the menu, maybe. Right, right. You had said and, and I certainly support that. I yeah. just I'm, I think the, the politics are what Elaine says there. Uh, you asked two questions, and I, the other one is about the re amortization. And I, I would just point out that it's actually secretly the same as the first question. Uh, the reamortization argument says pay the whole thing down like a mortgage. Uh, great. Now that will be a debt payment on top of normal cost of something between eight and billion, eight and nine billion a year. We're currently putting something like four billion toward pension debt payment plus normal costs. So that means 
overnight, it'll require either four to five billion dollars of new revenue or else four to five billion dollars of cuts elsewhere. Um, if we have that four or five billion dollars of new revenue and we made the determination um, to put it all toward pensions, then then yes, the the I'd much rather be on a mortgage than on a than on a ramp. But there's there's no way to make the math work out without a very substantial infusion of new revenue. And putting aside the politics of, of getting it, which is a weird thing to put aside, <laughs> but putting it aside, it be, yeah. let, let's sort of think for a second about what a government is. At that point, we'll be looking at, you know, I don't know, $36 billion of GRF, of which almost a quarter will be going to pay pension debt. That's an odd way to structure a government. And it's, a very, it's very hard to go before the people and say, we need your tax dollars uh, while we're cutting education, while we're shutting down mental health clinics, throwing people off of Medicaid. We need many more of your tax dollars to pay f for an accrued debt that was associated with services delivered a couple, a couple decades ago. It's, I just don't know that that's a, democracy wasn't built to have governments do stuff like that. That's the best answer I've ever heard to that question. <laughs> yeah. I'll suck up to you. <laughs> I noticed. Oh, go ahead, Joe. Oh, I was wondering when you were going to have numbers. I mean, it's really hard for me to visualize all these moving parts and understand where this leaves us next year and the year beyond, yeah. assuming it passes in January, which is a good assumption. But um, and and then. You've got the back bills to worry about as well, right. so there's the interaction with that as well. Right. Um, we think it's a matter of days um, before we'll have numbers okay. um, from, from, from the systems themselves. Um, I just want to make clear that the actuaries can give us some idea of what the benefit impacts mean in terms of reductions um, if we look at them in silos but they're inexact at, at best. And so I can't say, I can't ask the actuary to tell me, well, what does, um, you know, if we, if we change, if we, if we set a floor of $25,000 for receiving the COLA um, and give me, then give me, you know, what it means for 30, you have 35, 40, they have to run a complete actuarial analysis on each one of those scenarios, including all the other benefit impacts. And so it's really hard for us to then, it, as I, because I, I'm a, I'm a very linear math thinker. I'm like, well, of course it would be easy. I just would take some portion, you know, in, instead of it being 25,000, it's, you know, 5,000 more. What's the impact of that? I can figure that out mathematically. And the answer is no. You have to figure it out actuarially. So we're challenged to, um, you know, to, to tweak it in ways that make sense without continually, like, running numbers all the time. But so I just, it, it, again, I just caution that don't, you can't, we, we can't expect them to deliver the message in silos because they, they don't, that's not the way they do actuarial stuff. One thing about this plan, you know, the, the what I call the Cullerton, Eric Madeer plan, it did one thing really to the employees, it reduced their COLA. And of course it asked you to make a choice and all that, but that's a constitutional question. It was very easy to understand. Okay, I'm not getting 3% more, I'm getting half a CPI. This plan has a lot of a lot more different moving parts. I, I think it's kind of more difficult for some employees to understand. Is that is that because that's what it needed to have politically to get all of these people to get on as a co-sponsor, or can you can you go into the reason why you've kind of put forward a more complicated plan that now seems to have more support than anything we've seen so far? Two reasons. Um, number one. Elaine made this point really well to your question. The, every employee has a different um, sense of what the toughest benefit impact is. And that's, that's not because some are right and some are wrong. It's because they're in different life situations. And so we felt that it was unfair to concentrate all of the cuts on a particular lever and therefore make the person for whom that lever is the most important one feel much more pain. We thought mitigate all those things. You know, we, we could throw out everything except for the COLA and drop the 25000 to 15000 but then the person who is most sensitive to, to that, which is, what does that mean? It probably means the person who is um, about to retire at a young age and will live a long time. That person is really bearing 
the brunt of the consequences rather than now there's, there's, there's much more, we think, equitable distribution across different people. The other thing is the different levers allow you to achieve different policy goals. So the COLA with that, with that ceiling in it, we think is really good at sheltering the people with the least and concentrating the, the cut on the people who have the most and therefore can afford to give the most. The phased in retirement age, we think is a really good way to uh, shelter those who are near retirement, in this instance, those who are 45 or over, uh, while focusing the pain on those like me who have more time to adjust. Uh, it's hard to achieve all those different goals if you only have one lever at your disposal. It's, it's interesting to me too, Chris, because the, the complaint I heard about the choice model yeah. was that it was complicated and people okay. didn't know how to make decisions and they had to make, like, create, you know, they had to predict what their health circumstances were going to be. They had to predict, you know, um, their, how long they might live and they, they just, just couldn't get their head around that. And what I hear here is, well, you've laid it out. It's, I, can, I can understand each one of those benefit impacts. I, I, I get it. So I don't, I hear actually just the opposite. Yeah. I guess maybe I'm approaching it too much from a green eye shade. Okay, I can under, as a mathematically challenged reporter, I can understand cutting the CPI in half or whatever yeah. without all this other stuff. But yeah, I, I, see, your, I see what your point is. Yeah. We do think that it's user friendly, mm -hmm. and that's also true of the cash balance plan. The cash balance plan is a nightmare to explain, <laughs> but once you're in it, you just go to work and then you retire and you get your benefit, mm -hmm. as compared with a 401k where you're then all of a sudden your own little investment manager, which um, a lot of kindergarten teachers tell me they'd prefer not to be. And they could still do that through an IRA if they want to. Yes, of course. They, they, yeah. of course. Yeah. On the cash balance plan, I wrote a story a year, maybe two years ago, about how Tier 2, when it was passed, uh, didn't meet the requirement, or TRS figured out that it didn't meet the requirement for the Social Security safe harbor. Mm -hmm. It didn't, it basically won't provide enough for people who are retiring. If people who are in Tier 2, if they choose to go to the cash balance plan, does that fix that problem, yes. to your knowledge? Okay. Yes. And, and do you expect most people in Tier 2 now to choose to go over to cash balance? You know, one of the things that we like about this proposal is it doesn't, its success doesn't rely upon my ability to predict who's going to pick which option. I, I don't know. If I were advising them, I would say do it. Mm -hmm. I think it's a better deal than Tier 2. The technical answer to your question, by the way, is that uh, it's not legal for the IRS to give us a final answer on a bill. They mm -hmm. have to give us a final answer on a law. Yeah. yeah. But I spent a lot of time on the phone with the IRS this summer, and I have very good reason to believe that this will meet their approval for Safe Harbor. Yeah, I was just going to do that. So one of the other real um, wins in the cash balance plan is when we passed Tier 2, one of the major complaints we heard was, do you really want someone age 67 teaching kindergarten? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In this, on the cash balance plan, since it behaves much like a defined contribution plan, um, we pick the same age for retirement that you can start collecting on your defined contribution plan, which is 59 and a half. So it, dramatic, it, it really takes that issue off the table for, for those in tier two. That's specific, right. I'm sorry, can you say that? So does it move the retirement mm -hmm. age? Back to I, I didn't understand. Yeah. What you yes, said yes, it does. Yeah, you can start collecting because you have your because it's that. again like a defined contribution plan, and you have your own account. Mm -hmm. If you decide that you have enough in that account at age fifty nine and a half to retire, and that's a sufficient enough annuity for you, be my guest. Okay. Um, if you don't, and you want to keep working and and keep contributing in it to build up a little bit more, be my guest. And that's without penalty because tier two had Correct. penalties for retiring before sixty seven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Again, it's your own little it's your own little account that you're that's being yeah. cooked. Okay. Collected there. You were. You had something. To add. No. Okay. Is Rhode Island the state that one would go to to understand this in action, or is there a different uh, public system that has this element? To it? There are three now. Nebraska has been in place for a long, the longest time, for a decade, and then in the last year, um, both Louisiana and Kansas enacted them. Uh, the one that Kansas enacted, I think, is more similar to ours. Louisiana is a Less generous. I think, I think John Telma would, would like Louisiana's better. <laughs> <laughs> One other thing this does is it takes part of the Fortner idea of moving. Right now we, we have a bunch of bonded pension debt, and it takes, as those bonds get paid off, it takes the money that was being used to pay them off and applies it to the, to the debt. Unfunded Are you explaining that right? right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I was just, and this is a political question more than anything. Um, 
how come Fortner's not on the bill? Is he? Have you guys talked to him? I was just curious. How is, We've how talked to him. Okay. All right, I should say not we. Is there a reason my he's colleague not has talked to co sponsor or what is he? I, I should ask him, I suppose, but uh, yeah, I would be cautious to speak for him. I, I think he wants to see numbers in the cost shift. Yeah, you know, we're, we're, we feel really good that it's going to be workable, mm -hmm. um, but he wants to see the numbers first. Um, and you know, he has his own proposal that's different in a variety of ways, and um, you know, I think he. It's probably an opportunity for us to work with him and maybe incorporate more of those ideas and yeah, see where we get. As far as the as the cost shift, can you explain why this version of it is less painful? You alluded to this than what the, the leadership had come up with last last spring. Well, first of all, it's slower, yes. right? It was it was one percent one percent of payroll a year. Um, versus a half a percent of payroll a year. Um, we, uh, we, Daniel, um, made sure that we, there, was a, there was some changes to the language that protected the school districts from having to assume any of the unfunded liability. So making sure that the investment returns, the actuarial um, issues that might arise with regard to the unfunded liability did not impact um, the, 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 the cost that we would be shifting. And there's one other. I would say two others. One, the, the, I think the certainty is a big thing. Yeah. The, okay. the, the, yeah. plan, the plan with the choice, we said employees get to pick option A or option B. If they pick option A, the state saves money, but the pension systems don't. If they pick option B, the pension systems and the state both save money. We're going to shift the cost, and you better hope they pick option B and not option A, or else there's no savings at all. Because we have just one package of benefits that everybody gets, when we get our numbers back from Dick Ingram and Bill Mabe at SURS, we're going to know what the normal cost is. We think it'll be low, but whatever it'll be, it'll be. So there's that, that level of certainty they didn't have before. Um, and the one other thing that we haven't talked about today at all, but is, is really quite important, um, in the bill in the spring, the rhetoric around this issue was you know, when the Lake Forest School Board jacks up their superintendent's salary, the Lake Forest taxpayer should be on the hook for that, not the Springfield taxpayer. That's not what the bill said, though. Mm -hmm. Because what the bill said was that all employers had the same contribution rate. And so when the Lake Forest School Board jacked up that superintendent's salary, that just went into the pot that, that everybody was, was on the hook for equally. We fixed that in this bill. So now Springfield is on the hook for Springfield. Lake Forest is on the hook for Lake Forest. And so it truly, people are really accountable for their own decisions and not somebody else's. Okay. And politically, is that going over better? Are they warming to the idea? Can you generalize at all on, on what you've heard about that? I'd say generally people are coming to grips with the, are getting more comfortable with the fact that um, they, they've really come to grips with the fact that there have to be changes. Mm -hmm. Now they're coming to grips with the specific changes and what, the, what that will mean for employees, retirees, and employers. And so as they, and they're, they're, they're sort of uh, uh, putting it into their thinking and, and I've heard from school superintendents that you know, they're, already putting, they're already thinking about including that in their budgets and how would they do that. And so it's a, is that it just gets incorporated into the, what, what they're anticipating, they're getting a lot more comfortable with it. They still don't like it, and we hear a lot, you know, we still hear some, some pushback on it. But again, I, I think it's, it's um, uh, less angry and less forceful than it was last spring. I also We've got, I have to tell you, at, at every juncture along the way, with, for, the, for the 10 days before we introduced it, uh, you know, he was like, great, you know, go, I mean, in, I, not, you know, speaker never says great. You, you, you just, <laughs> when you say, you know, is there, is there any problem with doing it? And I take that as a no. So <laughs> we, went, we went ahead. You don't get a lot from him. Yeah. Well, he's also referred to it as Yeah, he, and he, he, I mean, publicly his comments were, and in private, I had the same comment privately, so it's not, um, it, you know, he, he supports comprehensive pension reform, and this is comprehensive pension reform. So he's been, there's been no indication in any stretch along the way that, that he would stand in the way. And Senator Collison? You're going to be in the Senate after Senator-elect Biss? Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs>
if, if they choose to seat me after all of this. I do love voting on pension bills, so. <laughs> um, we don't think we're going to get him off of his constitutional interpretation, yeah. but we don't think that's a deal killer. Uh, when I've spoken with him, he's said, you know, this isn't my preferred approach. I, I really trust Eric. Um, he's also acknowledged that if this bill comes out of the House with 48 or 24 or 72 hours left in the 97th General Assembly, there's going to be an overwhelming amount of pressure. And I think he, he wouldn't put it this way to me, but I think he acknowledges that um, for him, even if he's right, this is unconstitutional. He's better off passing this and letting the courts say that so that we then are essentially, we've resolved the argument about the Constitution and can go back to his framework. Um, so I think the model that we're likely to see happen is what happened with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District bill, which he also didn't think was constitutional, but he was a sponsor. And he said, this, I don't think this bill is constitutional, but other people do. Let's pass it and see. Is that in court right now? I, I mm -hmm. remember writing about it. No one sued about it. No one, no one has sued. It was kind of an Remarkably. agreed. It was kind of an agreed bill. It was an agreedish bit. bill. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> agreedish. Yeah, that's how. Yes, I, I think that's right. <laughs> they have, I think, twenty unions, and one of them was opposed. Right. The others were all. But neutral. all it takes is one angry one, member, one, and one. that that hasn't happened. Remarkably, that has not happened.